Hi, my name is Gavin Fisher and I'm from Form Factor. Welcome to our IMS 2020 micro apps presentation on optimization of load and source pool tuning to 110 GHz on wafer. So what's load pull all about? Essentially, under load pull, we take a device under test, which is putting an output signal B. That output signal, if we take a, if we thought of a normal S parameter setup, would be terminated in the characteristic impedance of the test system, typically 50 ohms. However, we wouldn't be able to understand the performance of that device, particularly the nonlinear performance, uh, when we pre when we are at impedances other than the characteristic impedance of the system. So in order to understand better the device performance, what we would like to do is to be able to place uh, a variety of different impedances that the device would see. Uh, this is done by effectively varying the, re the signal reflected from the load, the signal A, that the device will see. Now this reflected signal will be varied in a number of ways, either by uh, looking into a uh, variable passive load, such as a load pool tuner, or by injection of a signal um, which is coherent to B, or could be some combination of both the passive case and the active case. But essentially what we're doing is we're varying the reflection factor that the device will see. This reflection factor is essentially the reflected signal a divided by the output signal, B. B is created by the device itself, and A is created by uh, the variable load or by the active signal. In this slide, just to try to give you an overview of what the passive tuner is actually doing. So essentially we have a, our B signal, uh, which is coming emanating from the device, and it's propagating towards the termination. Inside the tuner, uh, we have um, uh, an airline, and the airline is effectively a, a very low loss transmission line, uh, and it you know should be you know very very minimal reflection uh, from that and good transmission to the load. So a signal propagates down that line, and very little of it is 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 returned. Now let's say we want that device to see this device here. Let's say we want this to see a very high reflect. So what the tuner would do is it takes a probe, which is like effectively a piece of metal, which can fit uh, in towards the uh, center conductor of the airline, and it gets very, very close to it. It's grounded, and so it creates a reflect. And then the signal, pro another B signal propagates towards it, but it gets almost entirely reflected and comes back to the device. Now let's say we want to tune uh, that reflect, but go to another um, area around the edge of the Smith chart, so the uh, probe is moved um, towards uh, the device. Another signal propagates it and reflects from a shorter distance away. Essentially that, or something very crudely represented by my diagram, is, is going on inside the tuner. Um, now, Things are not quite as simple as was presented in the previous slide, so uh, in some circumstances we may have um, complex output from the device containing uh, more, containing several harmonics. We would like to also be able to terminate those harmonics also with known impedances, and this is where things get a bit more complex inside the tuner, and it has three of these uh, probes which is designed to create um, three different sets of impedances uh, at the different frequencies of interest. Now, in an ideal world, we would have um, our device under test here would be able to see the whole range, the whole range and breadth of the Swift chart. We would be able to get all the way to the edge with almost in total reflect. Um, and, you know, the, the losses of these tuners are so low that actually that's quite close to reality for a connectorized device like this. You know, there's some losses inside these connectors and some loss on the airline, but effectively it's, you know, a very, very good reflect. You'll have a, a reflect very close to the, the edge of the Smith chart. But a more realistic solution or a more realistic setup is like this. We have a, a tuner 
uh, with a probe connected to it, and the probe is connected to the device, so there'll be some losses as the uh, probe couples into the wafer itself, and some losses through the actual uh, body of the probe. And as such, um, we will, there'll be less of the Smith chart that we can reach from this. Now, let's think of this. Let's think of the setup where we have. Uh, an actual cable in there. A lot of the time, this is unavoidable. Um, the cable um, happens uh, because the orientation of the tuner doesn't allow uh, it to connect to a probe and straight onto the wafer, especially for thermal uh, setups, thermal arrangements. And as such, you know, we try to have as low a loss cable as possible, but unavoidably, that loss creates an even smaller region of the Smith chart uh, that we can reach. And those are some of the compromises that you have to consider. Up until recently, for frequencies above 67 gigahertz, a lot of this work was done using waveguide tuners. Uh, waveguide is great because uh, the, the losses are, are comparatively low, even you know at 67 gigahertz, it's comparatively low anyway. Uh, but obviously, it's frequency limited due to the uh, the band of the uh, the waveguide that you've got. So challenges of, of load pull, just to summarize a little bit from that previous section, we want to be able to have, um, you know, really low insertion loss to get as much of the Smith chart as possible. Uh, we want to be able to uh, do some thermal work potentially with our devices. So that has a, a bunch of challenges associated with it, typically involving a cable. Uh, we want to basically get to small probes, small pads, we want to be able to get to small pads. Um, small pads require good microscopes, and, and typically this involves objectives with a fairly short working distance. Um, we also want to have good stability during probing. This slide is just showing you, you know, a visual comparison between uh, the 67 gigahertz tu delta tuner. So this is the new tuner or comparatively new tuner from Focus Microwave and the equivalent uh, unit that there would have been previously. So considerable difference in sizes and the uh, delta tuner was designed uh, from the ground up with the view of probing in mind. The idea of that you could get as close as is possible um, to the actual probe tip and allow direct mounting of the probe tip. So you can see uh, this in at use here. That this is a 110 gigahertz uh, tuner, and we have our objective right between the tuners. There's still room to get the probes overlapped, so there's not, it's not like the tuners touching the objective, and we can reach um, our nice small pads. Um, we've got the a good a good setup with uh, low insertion losses, so we've got good gamma. We can get to very small pads, you know, 30 microns. It's fairly straightforward to do. Uh, and we can use, you know, all the good accuracy of being able to find out our probe reference plane to do, you know, advanced cows like uh, LRRM and TRL. Um, the um, other thing to look at is the uh, positioners that we can use with these. So we uh, we can use if we want to motorized positioners or, or manual and they can be used on any of the form factor station platforms with the same uh, base uh, positioner arrangement and the same base arm. Um, we can um, get uh, some limited thermal work uh, with uh, even in an open environment or we can modify the setup and go over to you know, closed comparatively comparatively easily. Um, we have um, good visibility of the probe tips, uh, and we can use you know high performance digital microscopes. And we have this is you know not something we've just got pictures of. This is something we really have tested. We do know uh, that it works, and it's at customer sites uh, right now. Um, the other thing to note about it is that you can change the application very very easily because these probes, these uh, arms, are only mounted by a single screw on a dovetail. So, um, you know, in an ideal world, you'd have your probe directly mounted on here and you have the least loss, but sometimes that's not really an option. And that circumstance which is not an option is when we do over temperature. So when you're trying to get cold, uh, you want to have, you know, a dark and dry environment ar around those probes. Or certainly for temperature, you want it to have dry, otherwise you get condensation forming. So uh, we have an optimised um, uh application layer uh, that we use with this top hat assembly this is our this is actually a developed 
uh, previously for 110 gigahertz N5291A. So we've uh, modified it for use with the uh, Delta tuners. Uh, all this application layer here with all the, the arms and everything is all uh, custom made uh, for this application. Uh, we use a uh, flex shield. This is a uh, patented. It's our uh, uh, these basically this uh, boot arrangement. This is uh, EMI loaded, so it's uh, uh, we we get rid of the EMI uh, from the outside. Uh, no stiction, so we can make move around easily with motorized positioners. And the window that you see there that allows excellent uh, visibility of the probe tips that is uh, coated with ITO uh, to prevent build up of static. Uh, one thing also to just say uh, additionally uh, about the window area is that we can we have another cover plate which we can just cover straight over so you can instantly make it you know EMI shielded and dark. Um, we realize of course that um, you know you're not always going to have uh, a frequency extender attached to here. Uh, most setups will involve um, other instrumentation such as uh, power meters, couplers, amplifiers, bias T's and so forth and for this we uh, provide um, a uh, breadboard plate and we also have mounting points for which you could put custom breadboard plates to make uh, your setup uh, more complex. Um, we realize that also with um, uh, with load pool is that it's often to the case that no two are alike the the needs of customers vary quite significantly from uh, application to application. As such, you know, we realise that the uh, this region here, where we normally have access to our uh, uh, planarity controls, we can basically either have the planarity control up here, or we can have it underneath here. It's uh, it's optional, and so both are very ergonomic. Uh, just making the point that it's not only limited to 110 gigahertz. So we we also have uh, 67 gigahertz implementations with their own uh, special mounting plates. Again, with you know with cable or without cable. Uh, this slide just to show you some of the uh, options available uh, with regard to the application layer. So essentially, you would choose your you know the type of positioner body, either manual or programmable, and then it's up to you you know what arms you put on there. We have separate arms uh, for you know, changeable from a single screw uh, on a dovetail for 67 gigahertz, uh, 120 gigahertz with the N5291A, uh, all the gamut of VDI, VDI mini frequency extenders, or the uh, Focus uh, Delta tuners, uh, and then we'll basically just drop the necessary arm on. In fact, you could have them probe and everything all mounted, ready to go, uh, ready to just drop onto the positioner via the fast swap dovetail mounting. It's all easy and safe to do, uh, and you don't need to buy separate positioners for this sort of work. And they're both top hat and non top hat compatible. Um, just to make the point, some of our customers uh, also have the need for uh, more complex arrangements. So sometimes the real estate that's provided on uh, our normal RFA arm may not be viewed as sufficient. And as such, we, we have uh, potential for more complex arrangements. So we're actually using our large area positions for this. Uh, and so we're still using the uh, conventional R angled RFA arms uh, as standard. Uh, but we basically will have these mounted on large area positioners uh, and we have the ability to move the frequency extender on sliding rails uh, which will you know, aid the calibration process because we can slide them uh, t towards each other uh, to get them uh, the cable ends close to one another. Um, so we did some, you know, real evaluation of work. Um, I, I did this um, with the uh, with the uh, team from uh, Focus, uh, uh, Baolai. So uh, thank you very much for the work that uh, we did. That was a very useful learning experience for me. Um, uh, basically, we did this in the, the factory in, in, in Beaverton, and. Um, uh, Thanks also to uh, Vince Millet for uh, the assistance and uh, some of the slides that I've used in this presentation. Um, so yeah, this is a real life scenario that we tested in uh, in Oregon. Uh, we only had a single uh, load pool tuner, um, but uh, it was you know pretty representative of what a, a lot of customers do. So. Um, what the, the, the first stage really uh, for setting up these uh, load pool arrangements is to have uh, a coaxial calibration. This is down to the, the, the end of the cable and we provide good access 
uh, to get your hand in there to get at the coaxial standards. Um, you do need to get the end of the cables uh, together also, typically, uh, and as such, we can do have a quick release of the uh, extender. It's a single, a single catch which allows it to be released, and then you can slide them together on the platen and then make the connection. Uh, we use these um, short cables, you know, very uh, the very face stable uh, cables that we we use for this work. Uh, obviously, you don't want the reference plane of the cow to change with cable movement. Uh, and just making the point about the unclapping extenders. So once you've got your coaxial cow done, you would then uh, basically uh, de-embed the uh, the probe uh, and the tuner uh, from the measurement, and this is done uh, using. Uh, uh, Focus typically use a, a TRL cow for this, but I think it should be possible to do LRRM for this uh, also. So once that's done, um, the tuner will then go through and calibrate itself, put it through uh, a number of different states to uh, characterize uh, the, the nature of the tuner. And so the tuner then uses this information to be able to uh, give you a desired impedance uh, at the probe tip. This is just a, a run that shows you the tuner going through its uh, calibration process. So here's some of the results uh, from, from the work we did. So uh, we're looking at uh, three uh, different frequencies uh, on here and you can see the uh, gamma uh, achieved at those uh, different frequencies, uh, which is still pretty good even at uh, 96 gigahertz. So this was uh, directly connected. Um, in comparison, you know, you can see the uh, with and without cable uh, at 28 gigahertz. So at 28 gigahertz, the hit is really, you know, very minor, it's within, you know, 0.1. Um, so that's, that's really pretty impressive. So just as a quick uh, overall summary of the presentation, uh, we've presented to you a direct connect uh, tuning capability for uh, passive load pool tuning uh, with optimized gamma. We have the ability to also use the same uh, tuners uh, for uh, over temperature work in a uh, you know dark frost free environment with uh, a minimal trade off in gamma in the order of 0.15 gamma um, at the higher frequencies. Uh, we're still able to access the you know, high power microscope and use you know, conventional uh, objective lenses, high power objective lenses to probe small pads and we can perform a calibration of the system uh, with coaxial and both the you know, tuner calibration in a pretty standard easy to do format. Uh, we also have the ability to do fast and easy swap of the RFA arms for different measurement disciplines. And of course it fits on all the form factor platforms. I hope this presentation was useful. Take care now.